Welcome. It's great to see each of you here today. Do you all remember the game of tug of war? Any of you all play tug of war? Man, I remember tug of war when we were in scouts. And just like the, the three-legged, uh, was it at the bag race where you had the three or the egg toss? Man, the tug of war was something that was really something. You grab a hold of that rope and you pull with all your might. And sometimes, how many of you seen where they put like a big uh, muddy pit in the middle? Have you all seen that? And so the loser goes into the muddy pit. So you didn't want to be losing and going into the muddy pit. One of the things that we learned, uh, we, we had like a little strategy when, you, when it comes time to go, you like, everyone's got, gives a quick jerk it's as fast as you can to try to get the other team like off balance a little bit. And then, you know, once they're kind of stumbling forward, uh, you know, you, you got them. And so what today's message is going to be about is this whole idea of struggle, the whole idea of like this tension of, of pulling back and forth between what we want to do that we know is right and then this tendency that we have to do wrong. And so there was a hashtag a few years back. It was like the struggle is real. And so how many of you, you, you find yourself struggling sometimes to do the right thing? And if you struggle to do the right things, like, why am I struggling to do what's right? I know that I should be eating broccoli, but man, those Krispy Kreme donuts, man, they sure call my name. And I know that I should be going to the gym and exercising, but boy, man, I uh, just that lazy boy is really, it's hard to get out of. So the, the struggle that we all have is what we're going to be looking at today. This tension between good and bad, uh, evil, uh, doing what's right, struggling. That's what our message is today. So we're glad that you're here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and put up the, uh, the Bible bookshelf for you so that you can just be aware that we're going through all these books of the Bible. There's 66 of them, and they are united together, and, and they all point to Jesus Christ. And so from the law all the way to the very last book, it's all about Jesus. And so, so today, you'll see that it's about Jesus as well. And so you got the, the law, which is those first five books, that history in the middle, and then you have the poetry, major prophets, minor prophets, gospels, and now we drop down to that last shelf, that first book, which is a letter or an epistle that Paul wrote to this church in Rome. And so this letter is listed first, not because it was written first, but because it's the longest and it's the most comprehensive. And so it has a lot to do with setting a foundation for our faith. And it's, it's been wonderful. Chapter one we did as we opened up the series is about the fact that no one has excuses. Everyone uh, can see God clearly from the things that he has made. His divine attributes are clearly seen from what has been made. And so our tendency as human beings is to make excuses. Well, I didn't know or I don't want to believe or I don't have enough evidence. And so we are all guilty of sinning against God. And so there's no excuses. Last week, we looked at the fact that, that the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23, the Romans wrote. The wages of sin is death, but in uh, and we all have sinned that fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. How many of you have sinned before? Anyone here? All right, good. All of us are sinners. If you've lied, you are a liar. And, and you just kind of go on through there. All of us have sinned. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, Romans 6.23, is eternal life. So we have this bad news that we're sinners, but the good news is, is that there's eternal life in Jesus Christ. While we were sinners, Christ died for us, it says in Romans 5.8. That is, that is the good news of the gospel. So the Romans is about this good news. Bad news is we're sinners. The good news is we have a God who loves us, who died for us, who took our place upon the cross, paid for the penalty for our sins. That is the, the good news of the gospel. And, uh, and then uh, today we're just talking about how to live out that faith. And, and, and the fact that we have this struggle, we have this sinful nature that, that plexes. We're going to dig into this deeply today. There's 16 books in Romans, 16 chapters in Romans, and uh, today we're in chapter 7. We're going to be reading through all of it, though. And so uh, we have the Version Bible app. We'll put that up there. You can, if you want to read along with us, every single day we have readings in the book of Romans. We're going to cover all 16 chapters through our reading. So we may only hit chapter 1. We're, we're in here six weeks. So we hit chapter 1. We hit parts of 3, 5. And uh, 10 uh, last week, today's 7, next week is 8, and then we'll have uh, chapter 12 
as well. But all 16 will get read on that. So if you want to follow along and read daily, you can do that. Let me uh, lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have to open up your word and to see ourselves as we need to see ourselves. Lord, may we see ourselves in an honest way. And Lord, may we see you the way we need to see you. Lord, we thank you the fact that you are our Savior, you are our Lord, that you love us, that you died for us, that you have a plan for our lives. Lord, today I just pray that you'll speak to our hearts and thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior, our Deliverer, our Redeemer, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The struggle is real. Romans chapter 7. What shall we say then? Paul starts out. Paul is a master at asking questions, penetrating questions that get us to think deeply. And uh, Paul's going to ask 80 questions in this book of Romans. 80 questions. That's a lot of questions. And what Paul has done, Paul is like an amazing lawyer here. He's, he's setting out his, 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 uh, his argument, arguing on behalf of the fa- of, of, for the Lord. I mean, he's an incredible lawyer. He's got a very tight legal mind. So better call Paul, right? Better call Paul. And uh, Paul is one who he's, he's done a great job showing that all of us are guilty of sin. And he's made that case pretty clear. So the whole world is guilty. Jews are guilty. Gentiles are guilty. We are all guilty. And so he's asking us these questions to really set the case for this. And just like in the show, no one gets off. Everyone is guilty. Paul is setting that case as well. No one's getting off. Everyone is guilty. And we, we've learned that there is judgment, but, but God, through Jesus Christ, he paid our penalty for us. Now today, we're looking at the struggle. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would have Uh, not known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but then the commandment came and sin revived and I died. So what Paul is doing is he's going to be talking a lot about this whole concept of the law. And so the law is... um, something that you could blame. You could blame the law. Let me just talk about the law just for a moment because as we saw that there's a section of books called the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are the, the section of the law. And the law can be summarized in the Ten Commandments. Have you ever heard people say, I just want to follow the Ten Commandments? That's probably a good way to, to summarize the law down into ten understandable parts. Uh, so you have that law. That's very important. God's law He's going to say later that the law is holy, that the law is perfect, and that the law is spiritual. Let me read to you what uh, James says. James, the brother of Jesus, this is what he says about the law. He says, um, for the, the, <clears throat> he is like a man observing his face in the mirror, and he observes himself, and then he who looks into this perfect law. So, James is saying that the law is is perfect and it is like a mirror. So the mirror, uh, it it does its job by revealing something like, oh, hello, there's there's my face. Now, if I look at my face and I see a big old piece of broccoli in my teeth... That's what the mirror is revealing. Now, if I see the broccoli, uh, is it is it the mirror's fault? No, it's not the mirror's fault. Uh, I could get mad at the mirror. I can't believe the mirror. The mirror is just revealing what's already there. Whose fault is it that I have broccoli in my teeth? It's my fault. And so I can't I can't blame the mirror for the broccoli that's in my teeth. It's just revealing what's already there. Now, how about this? Is the mirror going to be able to help me get the broccoli out of my teeth? 
No, it, it, that's not what it's for. It's to reveal what the problem is. And so it's, it's very clear that there's a problem, and the mirror reveals that. Another way to think about this is that if you went swimming at the beach, and you dive in, and you're swimming, and next thing you look over, and there's a sign that says no swimming because there are sharks. Oops. You could get mad at the fact that the sign is there, but does that do any good, getting mad? Could you get mad at the fact that the people that put that sign, I'm mad at those people for putting that sign, I can't swim. No, that doesn't help either. Uh, is the sign going to be able to save you from the sharks? No, the sign just tells you to watch out for the sharks. So this is what the law is. The law just reveals who we are, reveals the problem within us, and so Paul is saying that he knows the law. And so two times he's using that word known. He says, uh, I, I would not have known it except to the law. I would have not known it. So twice he's saying he's talking about knowing it. So just because you know it doesn't mean that you can obey it, right? If you, just because you know something doesn't mean, I know I should, should eat healthy, but that's, knowing it and doing it is a different thing, isn't it? You can know, know all kinds of things, but, but that, necess, that doesn't necessarily help you. We learned in Romans 2, it says this, When the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, although not having the law, they show to have the work of the law written on their hearts. Their consciences bear witness and between themselves. So you have God's law written on our hearts through our conscience. So there is the law, God, well, what's right, right and wrong is written on our hearts. And, and, and even Gentiles have this written on their hearts. And this, this plays out. How many of you have heard someone say, but that's not fair? I mean, and they might not even be a believer, but they're saying that's not fair. Where are they getting this whole idea of, of what's fair and what's not fair? Where, where is that coming from? It's something inside of us, this whole idea of fairness and this law of fairness. Or how many of you have heard people say this? Uh, well, I just want to do the right thing. Well, what is the right thing? How do you know what the right thing is? And so they're exposing this very real inside feeling of fairness and of what's right and what is wrong. And so it's there and, 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 and we have it. So that's the Gentile. That's the unbeliever. God's law is written on their heart. But now, for the Jew, it's written down. And now there's no excuse. You, you know this, and it is clear, and it's in black and white, and, and here it is. Ouch. And so it's revealing. It's like, oh, man, I got problems. I got issues. And the law is the one showing me that I have these problems. So the first thing that we want to understand is that knowledge is not enough to save us from sin. Just knowing it alone doesn't fix the problem. You can know it and not do it. So oh, I'm going to learn more. Well, you're, now you're accountable for more. Right? It says in James, not many of you should be teachers because teachers are held to a higher standard. What we know, we now become accountable for. So knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And Paul says, I know it. Man, I know it, I know it. But it's not helping me to know it. Here's number one. The problem is that there's this deceptive aspect of sin. Sin has the ability to deceive me. Have you ever been deceived by sin? Have you ever been deceived by temptation? When we go back into the Garden of Eden, which is a place of perfection, where God made man and woman in his image, and he says, hey, you can have a, a ball here, but there's just one little tree over here. Don't, don't eat of that tree. And I can just imagine, I mean, it's like me walking by the Krispy Kremes or the chocolate cake or the ice cream. Like walking by, it's like, man, that sure does look good. And, uh, and we're drawn to it. And, and I know I shouldn't, but man, there it is. And, and so they had the standard, and God says don't. And, and, and then now you have the serpent coming onto the scene. And, and the serpent is like, 
did God really say that? And so now there's a questioning of God's word. And, and does God have the best for me? Or maybe not. And, and, and if we eat it, we won't die. No, that's a lie. God says, if you eat it, dying, you will die. And he says, oh, your, your eyes will be open. Oh, that's another lie. They're going to be shut in shame. And, and you'll be just like God. Oh, the worst lie of all. And so they were deceived, thinking, oh, this is going to help me. This is going to benefit me. This is what I need. Have you ever been deceived by sin in that way? Thinking, this is what I need. I long for this. I want this. I desire this. And so we're drawn to the sin, thinking this is what's going to give us freedom, only that it bonds us and it gives us bondage. And Jesus says that, that we can become a slave to sin. And the very thing that we thought we had to have, actually what binds us. And so we thought we had freedom. Now we have slavery. That's the deception of sin. We think, oh, I, I can just do it just once, right? Just once. Deception. No one will ever know. Deception. Sin has a way of rearing its ugly head, doesn't it? Sin has a way of becoming known, becoming manifest. And so all these different lies that the enemy tells or that we tell ourselves is this deceptive trap that gets us even worse. So there's this deceptive nature of sin. Oh, this is going to give me power. This is going to give me freedom. This is going to help me all to let me down. Verse 10, and so the commandment which, which was to bring life, I found to bring death for sin, taking the occasion by the commandment, deceived me. There it is. We're deceived. And it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy. So there it is again. God's law is holy. God's law is perfect. God's law is spiritual. It's not from man. It's not something that we make up. It's something that God has made up. And this is so important. This is why we study the word of God, because the word of God is, is, is from him. It's holy. It's set apart. It's perfect. It's spiritual. And when, when we have a problem with God's word, it means really we have a problem with ourselves. And so what some people do uh, in, in liberal Christianity or, or you know, whatever this, the, these different movements are, uh, they, they want to change the word of God. And let's be culturally relevant and let's change the word of God. We don't change the word of God. The word of God should change us. That's what needs to happen. It's holy. It's, it, it's pure. It's righteous. We come to the word and, and we don't like it because it condemns us. And that's the point of it. So it's deceiving to say, well, let me change it. Let me fix it. Let me make it modern. Let me make it up to date. You know, those are the old days, the old times. No, it's unchangeable. The word of the Lord lasts forever. Jesus says not a jot or a tittle is going to pass away. It's eternal. Like a human soul, the word of God is eternal. And so it's holy, it's spiritual, it's perfect, as James says, Verse 13, um, has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not, but sin that it might appear sin was producing death. This is the first time he's talking about this death in me. So this problem of sin is now in me and it's affecting me and it's causing death in me. That is a problem. Death is killing me. Sin is killing me. The wages of sin is death, as Paul said in Romans 6.23. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful for what we know is that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So you have God's perfect law revealing to us that we are sinful, we are carnal, we are in death spiral. That's the picture that he's pointing. Number two. So we have sin's deceptive nature. Number two, we have this aspect of the fact that sin is kicking our tail. All right. How many of you noticed that, it, that it's hard to be perfect? Have you noticed that? That's hard to be perfect. Anybody? It's hard to bat a thousand. It's hard to uh, score, you know, for your football team to score on every drive. <laughs> it's a struggle, right? Paul 
is being very, very honest here. Verse 15, for what I am doing, y'all help me out, what does he say? For what I'm doing, I do not what? Understand. This is important, isn't it? So even though you have the knowledge, that doesn't change anything. Knowledge won't help you. It just helps you understand where you're sinning. Have you ever, as a parent, asked your kid, what, why did you do that? I don't know. I don't know. Right? Have you ever asked your kid, why did you do that? I don't know. And it's what they say. And I, Nikki asked the kids that all the time, and I, I kind of learned even... As a, as a youngster, not to ask that in parenting because that was asked to me and I didn't have the answer. Daryl, why did you do that? I don't know. Why did you say that? I don't know. Why were you disobedient? I don't know. And I didn't have an answer. And, and have you noticed that that's how we are as people? If we were to follow you around and say, hey, why did you just do that? You'd probably go, I don't know why I just did that. I know I shouldn't do that, but I ended up doing it anyway. I should have said that, but, but, I, but I did that. I don't understand myself. Have you ever had that struggle, not understanding why you do what you do? I don't understand. Why did I play four hours of pickleball and I'm 55? I don't understand that. I just get out there and I'm competitive and the, and the adrenaline and the testosterone takes over. And not an excuse, but it is what it is, right? We just, we don't understand. So this is important too, because Paul is saying, think about this for a second. The apostle, apostle. Apostle means that he had this interaction with Jesus. Acts chapter 9. He, he's, he's on the road to Damascus and this bright, blinding light blinds him. And, and, and Jesus is talking to him saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and so he has this incredible encounter with Jesus. And he is an incredible church planter. He's an incredible missionary. He's an incredible preacher. He's an incredible author of the word of God. He wrote Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, all of these books that he wrote, uh, the majority of the New Testament. Here's someone that, that could heal uh, people. Uh, they, they took rags and, 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 and that had touched him and, and brought healing. Uh, the people had died. A kid fell out of a window and, and Paul was able to, to raise him back from the dead. Uh, one time he shipwrecked and he, he's gathering wood for the fire and he, and he puts his, his wood in the fire and all of a sudden this big serpent, uh, poisonous snakes, grab a hold of his, of his hand and thought, oh, he's dead. Paul just shakes it off and, and goes on with life. I mean, this is a man who was anointed by the Lord and he saw the Lord and he had uh, apostolic power. And yet he says, I don't understand why I do what I do. And I find that very encouraging. Do you? Because if the apostle Paul can't understand why he does some things, he can't understand why his sinful nature is strong in his life. Do you think that you're going to be able to overcome your sinful nature? I mean, there's only one perfect person, right? It was Jesus Christ. Everyone else is a sinner with a sinful nature. So Paul acknowledges that he is a sinner with a sinful nature. Now let's look at how he's going to, to, to talk about this because there's different ways of looking at this section. Romans 7 can be controversial for some and the commentators kind of struggle with with what this could be. Some people think that this is talking about the unsaved or the non-Christian and the non-Christian uh, and the fact that they, they have sin. Some people think that this is talking about the, the carnal Christian, the, the Christian that's really, you know, they're not following the Lord the way that they should. Well, I think that this better represents the honest Christian. The honest Christian. And let's look at Paul's honesty. So he's going to use the word I, me, my about 40 times here. Uh, for what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. So th that's just it. So number one, knowledge won't help you. Number two, willpower doesn't help you, does it? Have you noticed that? 
every January, let's make some resolutions. I'm going to go to the gym. And then two weeks later, what happens to the gym? I'm going to eat right. And then a week later, what's happening? We're not eating right. And over and over and over, we try to will it to be done. I'm going to make this happen. It's... How many of you have broken your, your New Year's resolutions? I mean, everyone, right? You, you find that even though you try to will something to happen, something, there's a loose screw, <laughs> there's a misconnection, something happens to where we cannot will our way through everything that we think that we can will our way through. Paul says, what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate to do, that I do. If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that it is good. The law is condemning me. In other words, it's telling me that I'm a sinner, that I'm a coveter, that I'm a liar. Verse 17, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells. There it is again. Where's the sin? In me. So that's that sinful nature. It is in me. It is a part of of me. It's very honest. I want to do right, but there's something inside of me that interferes with me being able to do right. Sin dwells in me, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, you'll help me out, I even underline it for you, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Nothing good dwells. Now, some people say, I've heard this often, well, people are basically good. Have you ever heard that? People are basically good at their core. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, nothing good dwells in me. It says in, in, in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitfully wicked. So we have a wicked heart, and we have a sinful nature, and we have a flesh that there's nothing good there. And that is... That is our problem. That is our struggle. And so there's a struggle between the sinful nature and the struggle between the Holy Spirit, the, the godly nature. It's just back and forth, back and forth. Verse 19, for the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that is what I practice. Wow, that's honesty. That's honesty. I am not perfect. I struggle, Paul says. Isn't it, isn't it refreshing when people are honest about their, their shortcomings and they act like they don't have it all together? Have you ever met someone that thinks that they're perfect? It's kind of difficult to deal with a person like that, isn't it? Because, and that's how some people can read uh, Romans 7. Is that's for, that's for non-Christians. I'm in, I'm in chapter 8, man. I'm the victorious Christian, and I can do no wrong. I, I don't really think you can really appreciate chapter 8 until you've really wrestled with chapter 7. See, chapter 7 is that bridge that leads to chapter 8. Chapter 8's amazing. Victory in Christ. But, man, chapter 7 is where you have to really understand uh, who we are as people. Paul says, the sin dwells in me, and I find that the law, that evil is present within, there it is again, where's the evil? It's present with me for the one who wills to do good. Verse 22, this is why, again, I think that this is not talking about a non-Christian or necessarily even a carnal Christian because it says that he delights in the law of God. In other words, he wants to. He's trying to. And that is, that's what a believer is, is doing, right? As a believer, since I have Jesus Christ in, in me, since I, I'm, I'm a Christian, I have God's Holy Spirit, then, then I, I'm desiring to follow the Word of God. I'm desiring to do what God has called me to do. Those are my desires, is to, to, to believe, to obey, to trust, to have faith. That's my desire now that I have Christ inside of me. And so if that's my desire, Desire, then, then why do I struggle? And so when I struggle, it's like, oh, we become frustrated. That's a good sign, is it? That's a good sign that the Holy Spirit is actually working in us, showing us what is right, what is wrong, and where we need the help. That's honesty, isn't it? Honesty is the best policy. We need to be honest. And so it's the fact that sin is kicking my tail, 
sin has this grip in my life, and I want to do what's right, but I don't do that. Robert Louis Stevenson, he had, uh, he's a great author, uh, the author of Treasure Island. Uh, he also wrote a great novel called uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. How many of you have heard of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? So Dr. Jekyll was this moral seeming guy and he was a doctor and he was wanting to help people and he and, and you know he looked you know on the outside like he uh, was good for society and he was you know a good guy but he had this nature that uh, he wanted to do bad things and he wanted to carry out these bad things and these evil things and he wanted to be disrespectful and harmful and hurtful and and and, and so this was his his nature and so he developed this potion where he could take this potion Dr. Jekyll would take this potion that he developed so that he could be Mr. Hyde and then Mr. Hyde could could carry out these evil desires woohoo and, and so he's he's living this this dual life and he thought he could control it with this potion, but there came a time where, where Mr. Hyde could just have his will and have his way and, and, and take over. And so many people kind of wondered about Robert Louis Stevenson's background. He grew up in a very uh, conservative Presbyterian home where they prayed daily. He had a very godly father, and he went to church, and, and when the doors were open, they were there. And when Robert, Robert Stevenson left and went off to college, he did like a lot of us, myself included, and he said, well, do I really need that faith? Do I really need what my parents' teachings? I think I'll do what I want to do. And he became a prodigal and uh, was claimed to be agnostic. And he, he, he went away from his faith. He struggled internally. But then his wife published some uh, prayers that he had. And so he would, at, at, uh, when he was married and had kids, he would do devotionals, and some of his prayers are just beautiful. And so you could see that uh, he had faith, and then he struggled in his faith, and then he came back to his faith. And so this whole idea of Jekyll and Hyde is something that, even in his own life, he's trying to express through, through the words. How many of you can, can relate to Jekyll and hide to the good, to the bad, to the struggle, to want to do what's right, but, but, but you fail, and you don't hit a thousand. The, the dominating nature of sin. So what do we do? I mean, where do you find relief? If knowing it doesn't help, if the willpower doesn't help, what are we to do? Where, where does our help come from? Amen. It's Jesus Christ is where the help comes from. So in, in psychology, how many of you had to take psychology? Any of you had to take psychology, the social sciences? And the social sciences, they, they study this kind of thing, and they recognize. I mean, you got Freud trying to understand things. And, and, and Jung, he came up with this idea of the shadow self. And so you got this shadow self. And so psychology can identify, oh, you got this dark side. You got this shadow self. But here's the thing about social science. They can tell you you got the dark side, but they really don't have a way to, to overcome it. Here's some drugs. I mean, that's not going to help, is it? Where do we find help from this dark side? Well, Paul is going to tell us. Number three, Christ delivers me. Christ delivers me. This is such good news. This is such good news because as sinners, we're dead in our sin. We've got this sin that's a part of our lives. It's keeping us from doing what we need to do. It's this mess in our lives. But Paul says this, verse 23, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, the law which sin, which is in my members. Verse 24. Woo! Oh, wretched man that I am. I'll just stop right there. Do you know that that is your true state, that you are wretched? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a what? A wretch like me. That song resonates with so many people. Yes, because grace is amazing, but in order for it to be amazing, it's saving the wretch. Who's the wretch? Me. I'm the wretch. 
I am wretched. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. That's why I need grace. That's why grace is amazing because God, perfect God, has offered his grace to a wretched sinner like me. I am a wretched sinner. You are a wretched sinner. We must honestly know that that's who we are apart from Jesus Christ. We are wretched. We are dead in, the trespass, in our trespasses and sin. There is nothing good that dwells in us. We're not going to follow the law and save ourselves. We're not going to will, our will ourselves and save ourselves. It's only through Jesus Christ. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will deliver me from this body of death? In Roman times, you're probably familiar with one of their terrible uh, capital punishments of the cross, nailing a criminal to a cross to just suffer and die and asphyxiate. Well, another thing that they would do, and this is what Paul's referring to, if someone was a murderer, they could, uh, they could attach the dead body to the person. And so just imagine you, you have this dead body fastened to you. And as this dead body begins to rot... And the, and the putrid odors and smells and juices and, and infection takes over. Guess what it does to the body? That dead body begins to putrefy and rot the person. And they begin to die this horrible, slow death of, of, of infection. And this is what Paul is saying is that, man, I've got this dead body attached to me. And, and guess what? Who is going to deliver me from this dead body that's attached to me? I thank God is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, here's the thing. If you've been tied to a dead body, guess what is going to be able to deliver you from that? It's Christ that cuts the cords. It's Christ that takes off the cord. And your dead body is now separated. You don't have that dead body because Christ is the one who delivered you. Christ is the one who rescued you. This is the, this is the picture. It says, uh, thank, it's, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that he delivered me, that he rescued me. And so the picture, the message translation says it like this, is that uh, Eugene Peterson, he translated, he says, I was at the end of my rope. <laughs> and so when you're at the end of your rope, what hope do you have? You, you, the only hope you have is for someone to extend out a, a rope to you. And this is exactly what Christ has done. Christ has extended out. He has delivered. He has rescued. He has saved. It's like you're drowning and, and Christ is reaching down the rope. It's like you're in flames and Christ is reaching down the rope. You're dead. You're dying. You're in quicksand. And Christ is the one reaching down the rope. He's delivering you. He's saving you. He's rescuing you. That's what Christ does. He's the Savior. He's the Deliverer. Now, as mankind, we think, oh, yeah, like the Tower of Babel. Oh, yeah, in my humanity, oh, I'm going to build a tower to God. I'm going to get to God with my good works. No, you don't. Christ had to come down from heaven, and he came down from heaven to save us. And we were on the way down to hell, and Christ reached down into hell and said, come out, let me help you. And so he's the one reaching down. We're the one falling down. He's reaching down. We're not going up to heaven. It's Christ who saves us, Christ who redeems us, Christ who delivers us. Amen. Who will deliver me? Not the law, not my good works. Who will deliver me? Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. We're a sinner, can't save ourselves. Christ is the one who delivers, who saves, who rescues us. So if you're here today and, and you're not a believer, then today's the, say, the day to realize, yeah, man, I, I don't need self-help. I need God help, Amen. right? I, I don't need to, to do better. See, as sinners, it's not about doing better, but it's about sinners don't need to do better. Sinners need a deliverer. Sinners don't need to do better. Sinners need a deliverer. And that's what Christ is. Christ is our deliverer. He saves us. It's not about knowing more. It's not about trying harder. It's about being delivered, being rescued. Jesus Christ. And when Christ is inside us, we must re recognize the fact that we're in process. This is so important. There's this tension between what is now and what will be. 
Philippians 1 says this, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So there's this, and this completing process is called sanctification. Sanctification. It's that picture of dying to self and raising to walk in new life in Christ. It's taking step after step with Jesus. We're connected to Jesus. He is our life. He is our resurrection. He is our Lord. He is everything. And the old is gone. And now we don't focus on the old, but now we're focusing on Christ. And it's this process. It says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new is coming. It's this metamorphosis is how the Bible also talks about it. Changing from a worm into a butterfly. That takes some time, doesn't it? There's this process where this takes place. And it keeps on happening. It keeps on happening. And then there's this point of death. And so at death, we cross over from death to life. We crossed over. It's like, whoo-hoo, the old cancer, the old life, uh, all that is gone. Now I have a new life in Christ. I, I don't have cancer anymore. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more sadness. I am new, completely new in Jesus Christ. That is the process. And so we have a dying body, and then after death, it becomes a glorified body. But they're in that, that process, we're, 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 it, it takes some time. And we must be honest about our condition. Yesterday evening, we had the AA group that meets here on Wednesday nights. They had their, their celebration. And I thought it was very interesting. Uh, I was here watching, and there was an 84-year-old guy. And uh, he's been sober for 56 years. Yeah, that's impressive. And I noticed something. As each one came up, and kind of introduced themselves. They had several people give a testimony or whatever. Each one of them would cut up and say, hi, I'm, I'm Bill, and I'm alcoholic. Hi, I'm Rose, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. And I thought about that for a minute. It's like, wow, what if, what if Christians, we did, we did that a little bit more often. We were honest about what our struggles are. Hi, I'm Daryl. I'm a glutton. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm a control freak. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm a gossip. Hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm greedy. It would just really help us to realize, yeah, this is my area of being honest before the Lord, honest to myself, and honest to others that I'm not Jesus, and I don't have it all figured out, and I'm not perfect. I struggle. And so he said that his sponsor told him this. He says, if you're going to be successful, he says, when you get up in the morning, you need to get out on your knees and you just say, Lord, I need you. Lord, help me to be sober today. And then he says, if you go through the day and, 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 and the Lord has helped you, get out on your hand, get out on your knees again and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, thank you for helping me be sober today. And that's day one. And guess what you got to do? You got to do that day two, day three, all the way until you get to 56 years. The fact that Jesus... I need you. Jesus, you are the only one that can help me. It's not the law. It's not willpower. It's not being good. It is you and you alone, my Savior, my Deliverer. You are the one. And so as you're here as a believer, then, man, we've got to hold on to Christ. He's our Deliverer. He's our Savior. And be honest about that. I'm a sinner. He is my Savior. I am weak, but he is strong. So that's Romans 7. Will you be honest enough to say that you're a sinner and that you're not perfect and that you need the Lord and you got to hang on to him? You can't save yourself through your good deeds, through the law, or through willpower. It's Christ and Christ alone. And then as we go through chapter 7. I'm just going to read you the very, very, very first verse of chapter 8, and we'll be there next week. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that sound good? 
right? I mean, we may condemn ourselves, but Christ is not condemning us. Religious people may condemn us. Christ is not condemning us. If we are in Christ, there is no condemnation. That's where the freedom is, not in the sin. It's in Christ. That's where the joy is. It's not in, in the sin. It's in Christ. Christ is the one who gives us the freedom, the joy, and as we'll see in chapter 8, the victory. And so we'll learn more about that connection that we have with Christ next week. Let me close this in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, today I pray that each of us, like Paul, would be honest and say, nothing good dwells in me. I am wretched. What I want to do, I don't do. It's not about me knowing. It's not about me understanding it. It's not about me trying harder. Lord Jesus, it's about you. And so if you're here today and you do not know Jesus today, is the day to say, Jesus, I need you. Come in my life. Change me. Transform me. Give me a new nature, new desires. Give me the presence of your Holy Spirit. If you're here today as a believer, also, it's about Jesus. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we're sinners and you're our Savior. We can't do this alone without you. Why did we think that we're so strong and we're so good? Lord, it's, it, we're not. You are. And so, Lord Jesus, we want to trust you. We want to have faith in you. We want to depend upon you. We know that victory is in you and there's no condemnation to you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you made a decision today, be sure and put that on your connection card. God bless you.